And the answer to this seems to be that they don't want to accept the clear instructions in the scriptures. Uh, uh, just the other day, uh, somebody was posting on the forum that it's okay to have illicit sex if you're a married couple. Uh, well, we don't accept this. We can't accept this because Srila Prabhupada didn't teach that and the Vedas don't teach that. Uh, and somebody might say, well, nobody can come to that standard. Well, we're at that standard. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that people don't want to change. And if you don't want to change, if you don't want to come to the standard, and you say that, very, make it very clear, I don't want to come to the highest standard. I don't want to reach the, the highest level of self-realization that's okay. I'd much rather have a little pleasure now than a lot of pleasure later by attaining self-realization. Well, that's okay. That's your choice. You can do that. But don't try to change the philosophy. We won't accept that. And Krishna won't accept that. So what we really need is to have different levels of practice for people who have different levels of aspiration. Mm -hmm. People who want the highest, who want to go back to the spiritual world in this lifetime, they should practice celibacy because this is advised in the Vedas. It's all over the Vedas. It's in every scripture I've ever read, even the Bible, huh? that if someone is called to come to the spiritual world, they should practice celibacy. Why? Because the sex life impulse is the most uh, aberrating, the most uh, attaching, the most identification that we have with this material world. Uh, if somebody says, what are you? You say, I'm a man or I'm a woman. Uh, that's the first thing, the first item of identity, the first uh, identification of the false ego. I'm a male or I'm a female, isn't it? So when we think of ourself, if we start off from this idea that I am this body and this body is either male or female, then we're in material consciousness. But if we think of ourselves and our identity in relation to Krishna, then it's like we're neither male nor female. We're neither young nor old. We're neither black nor white nor from this country or that country, or this family or that family. Huh? We're not uh, a member of a particular race or creed or religion or political identification. None of that applies. We're all spirit souls and we're eternal children of Krishna, of God. So what is the point of, of this sex life? is simply to propagate the material body, uh, to create more embodiments for more conditioned souls to come into this world and suffer. Uh, so why do we want to be associated with that process? Uh, that's nasty. It's, you know, it's the root cause of all suffering is this material body. You take any problem, any suffering, any uh, inconvenience that you can name is all dependent on the body. It all, all originates from the body. Uh, so the soul is not ever a source of problems. Oh, it's always the body. The body is hurting, or the body needs to be fed, or the body needs this, or the body needs that. Uh, the mind is also part of the body. So mental and emotional suffering is also there. Because the body is conditioned by the laws of material nature, sometimes it's under the mode of goodness and we feel, oh, I'm enjoying. Sometimes it's under the mode of passion and we have to work very hard. Sometimes it's under the mode of ignorance and we're suffering. And just like this last week, I've been very sick. Well, this body anyway. <laughs> it always happens after an initiation. The guru has to take the karma. Of the disciple. 
and transform it or transmute it uh, so the disciple can attain spiritual enlightenment. Otherwise, there's no way because um, the karma actually stops us from material, sorry, from spiritual consciousness. I just realized we don't have a Tulsi plant. Duh. Well, yeah. Got to have a Tulsi plant. Yeah, my buddy. <laughs> so um, when we're suffering from too much karma, then we can't think of Krishna. We can't meditate. We can't chant. Huh? Why? Because, oh, I have to go here and do this and do that. Huh? I have to go to work. I have to take care of my family. I have to um, go here and do this, go there, do that, blah, 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 blah. And on and on. And it never stops. Huh? It's an endless chain. We do one act of karma, of material activity, and then that creates more karma, which causes another thing to take place, and then that causes more karma, etc., etc., etc. So when does it ever end? Okay. What we're trying to do is create an atmosphere, to create an association, where we're not performing karma activities. We're performing nishkarma, akarma. Huh? It means there's no karmic reaction. Uh, Tulsi Devi Ki Jai. Ah, that's better. Now I feel normal. <laughs> so, Nishkarma means activity that doesn't create any karmic reaction. And Akarma means activities that actually dissolve karma. Devotional service, chanting, authentic Vedic meditations, and um, reading the scriptures and like that actually dissolves karma. It removes the karma that we've been accumulating for thousands and millions of lives. And so it brings us to the place where we can perform devotional service. Devotional service means activity on the spiritual platform. Activity on the platform of I am a spirit soul. I'm not this body. I'm not Mr. So-and-so uh, from this family or that country or this race or this planet. Huh? I can live on any planet. I can go anywhere. Uh, the consciousness, the soul, is all-pervading. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that the soul is all-pervading. And there's two kinds of all-pervading. One kind is the soul is all-pervading in the body. So even though the soul is situated within the heart, uh, still we can feel sensation over our whole body because the soul is all-pervading throughout the body by means of the prana. By means of prana, there's five kinds of prana. And the prana, there is ultimately one, but it manifests in five different ways. And so these different, five different kinds of, of prana go everywhere in the body, and they control all the bodily systems. So by this prana, we are aware of the different sensations in the body, just like I can smell that incense over there, even though it's on the other side of the room, because the air brings the uh, odor of the incense to my nose. Similarly, the prana brings the sensations in the different parts of the body to the heart, because the heart is the center of all the pranas. This is described in Vedanta Sutra very nicely. So by the pranas, we also control the body, uh, those functions that are accessible to our control. <laughs> And the super soul also controls the other functions of the body that are not accessible to our control, such as digestion, the endocrine system, the autonom auto autonomic nervous system, and so on. So super soul is there along with the conditioned soul in the heart, but the conditioned soul is trapped and the super soul is free. Uh, 
It's described in Upanishads that there are two birds on the tree of the body. And one bird is tasting the fruits. And some are sweet and some are bitter. Uh, and that's the conditioned soul. And the other bird is just watching him. He's the watcher. He's the witness. Uh, that's the super soul. So super soul is there, along with the conditioned soul, in every body. Uh, and he's just watching. He's just waiting. Waiting for the time when the conditioned soul is going to turn to him and say, oh, let's fly away from here. <laughs> let's go back to our real home. Huh? These fruits are no good. Huh? I'd rather have your company. Huh? And, and when they realize that, then the two birds fly away and uh, they're happily.